you say we have to look? Yes, so basically, I cannot change everyone else, but I can be a better example to others and hope that they adjust their behavior. Yeah. But I still think, even if someone's sorry, even if someone is not authentic and they're teaching something, you can still benefit from the teaching. Just leave away their behavior, right? Take the advice, right? I mean, there are books of some Tibetan masters. Their behavior is not that good, but their books are really good. I read the books. I ignore the behavior. I benefit from the books. So it's also good sometimes to differentiate. A person is much more complex. Focus on the good one, good aspects, be inspired by that, and leave the rest for the time being. You can also do that. But it's definitely better if you have the full pass package. Yes. I'm sorry. Right? It's another subject. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you spoke about meditation. Yes. And uh, do, you mentioned drawing. <coughs> and, now, and I know that Tibetan is painting the mandala. Mm -hmm. And I want to know why why they do it and why they destroy it after that. Ah. Oh. <coughs> yeah, the mandala. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something like meditation. That's why. Uh, it depends. Okay, that's why. It depends. Some people, it's not a matter. I mean, actually, the idea is, and this is very advanced, this is high, it's Tantra. It's a very high level. Yes, the mandala, the mandala is the universe of a Buddha. Okay, so it's, it basically, it's symbolic for the world of a Buddha and a, a, a kind of a, a meditational Buddha figure that you try to meditate on as a, as a technique. It's just, it's a psychology. Tantra is very advanced psychology that's all it is it's like i said the philosophy is the same as we learn right now and then you you take certain techniques that are effective for the mind which bring you to a result faster <coughs> but it's potentially very dangerous okay because anything that is faster you're more likely to crush to have a crash okay anyway having said this so it's part of tantra and Tantra works a lot with sense objects, for instance. Look at these drawings, colors and shapes that affect the mind in a certain way. So when you do this mandala, for instance, you do visualization, you do some kind of meditation, that's a type of visualization, which initially is not that important for us. We can train ourselves a little bit in our, those visualizations, but the real deal is when you do Tantra. And so those who do these who create these images, let's say those are actually doing the visualization, they go through a process of meditation, visualizing this meditational deity, which stands for compassion, for instance. So to train your mind in the quality of compassion, to put it simply. And then in the end, you destroy it. Well, just to remind yourself also of the impermanence. So, you destroy it. It's like life, it's life. It's a kind of a short... It's like a, a, a quick version of life. You work, 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 work hard, and then in the end it's done. Right? Even the Buddha comes and goes. So it's kind of a representation of that, I guess, just simply put. Yes. Um, I have a question about... I don't know how to put the, the question. <laughs> there's, uh, there's some uh, sensations that are emotional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So about the mind, mm -hmm. is it, it because it's some kind of a physical consciousness, but also emotional, like mental, I don't know, it's like a meeting point, which comes first? Physical consciousness, do you mean like a sense consciousness? Yeah, for example, when you, uh, crying is maybe the best example, actually. Ah. Something like that, but some, I, I thought... I think what you're trying to say is maybe that there are emotions that have a physical uh, effect on the body. <laughs> or maybe there's a physical effect on the body that gives rise to an emotion, mm -hmm. and then the emotion in turn again gives rise to a physical response. Mm -hmm. So you get hit over the head, right? Yeah. You get angry, you get so angry, you start crying, right? Or you get hit over the head, you get so upset, that then you start crying. Would that be an example of something physical happens to you, then there's an emotional response which gives rise to another physical reaction. Is that what you mean? Maybe, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to, um, like, in 
a very organized way to mm -hmm. uh, put the place of the like crying in the sense of tear water coming out of the body that is connected to an emotion. I agree. So this is actually an interesting idea, very important idea that is described in the Pramanavatika, the second chapter of the a text in Tibetan called, or in, in Sanskrit called Pramanavatika. Mm -hmm. It's a text, the, one of the main texts on logic in the Buddhist tradition. And the second chapter deals a lot with the relationship between mind and body in the context of does the mind continue after death and does, did it exist before. And there's so much emphasis on that. And it's very interesting in that context. For instance, we've all had that experience, I guess. We get really upset, really uptight. There's a lot of tension in our mind. And at some point, we can no longer bear it. We cry and we feel better. Because certain chemicals are released through those tears that were created by the upset mind. So every time we have a thought, every time we have an emotion, there's always a physical, something happens on a physical level, whether we're aware or not. That accounts for, possibly, if you're very frustrated and you have certain negative minds, they could actually lead to a cancerous growth in the body, for instance. So such is the power of our mind. And right now we cannot channel that power correctly, and that's part of Buddhist practice. But understanding that first, that's why I said previously, if you want to be healthier physically, generate more love and compassion. Work on your anger. Because every thought we think releases chemicals in the body, however subtle they are. And so I think this example is a good example. When you are frustrated, when there's fear, you actually, there's a smell. Your body creates a certain smell when you're fearful, right? When, you, when you're around people who have fear, they have a sometimes negative, like an un, unpleasant kind of smell. Because chemicals are released in the body and maybe that's just to ward off certain enemies. <laughs> Traditionally, I don't know. But there's some chemicals released in the body, definitely, when you have fear, when you are stressed out, etc. And when you cry, you feel better. <laughs> because through your tears, those chemicals are released. And whatever kept you up tight, it's gone. Does that make sense? And also, when you feel depressed, exercising may help you. Because it releases some of those tensions that build up in your body and so when those tensions are gone in the body you mentally feel better yeah. Shuba, when, uh, sorry you're next <laughs> sorry i keep forgetting you <laughs> yeah. when a uh, uh, arahat an arahat yeah um, a liberated person yes it doesn't have uh, any self-grasping mm -hmm. and don't have the motivation to come back mm -hmm. so what actually continue Okay, so Haya, Haya's question, is it Haya or Haya? Haya. 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 Okay. Anyway, Haya's question is not with regard to a Buddha, but with regard to someone who's closer to Buddhahood, as in like having removed the root misperception of reality. Okay. So once you've done that, and there's no wish to come back, to be reborn again, what are you left with? <laughs> of course you are. With your mind. After achieving Buddhahood, oh, I mean, Mental, right. yeah, you are, you yeah. still have your mind. There is cessation of mind once you... No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's the lowest schools. <laughs> according to the, according to the Tibetan tradition, so it's debatable, but from the tradition, your mind can't stop. Your mind cannot go out of existence. Nothing can totally stop. Not even something physical. Nothing physical can be there one moment and gone the next moment. It will continue on in a different form. So also the mind cannot just stop. Right? Even your brain. What makes up your brain, the particles, they will continue on and transform into something else. So your mind, and the mind doesn't disperse because it's not made of atoms. So the physical object can disperse, but the atoms don't go out of existence. So the mind continues on, but it doesn't have a body. It doesn't necessarily have, there's not necessarily a body because 
the body previously that was a result of the afflictions, that's gone. And you have not generated the wish to have a body to benefit others yet. That is strong as a bodhisattva. So there is this time when there's just the mental consciousness. Pardon? Is it in the formless reality or something? Form or formless can be in this world. It could be in this world. It could just be where you died, right? Wherever you died, there's still your corpse and you, you're still meditating there. So they found, they said that there are these meditators, they, they uncovered meditators in the mountains. Um, in Kuno, there they found this meditator in a mountain, and maybe I don't know. They, it was really well preserved, and that was said to be a monk. And the fingernails had started; they continued growing for a time, so they could kind of tell this person had been dead. But the the the, the body continued. I don't know how they kind of established that, but the body continued to, to to kind of be there still. So the mind was still around for a while. And maybe that person, I don't know exactly, don't remember all the details, but the mind was still there and it could still be there for a long time. So an arhat can continue for a while to stay in that blissful state for a really long period of time, but eventually they'll enter the bodhisattva path. There's no way around it. Everyone will eventually enter the bodhisattva path. That's the, again, Tibetan Buddhist assertion because we have this pure Buddha mind and we have the potential to go on and if the obstacle, the main obstacle is removed, sooner or later the mind will go on and you, you will enter the Mahayana path. So the mind is just still there, it's just meditating on emptiness, it's just meditating on this blissful state. So you're in this blissful state. The analogic of uh, when we have the grasping mind, like grasp to the eye, like that we are like uh, eyes, and when uh, there is no grasping, like uh, we are again uh, water. So where is the block of ice? So what is what makes the continuum the water a dif a distinguished continuum without the the grasping to the eye? Well, there doesn't need to be a grasping of the mind. There's a mind realizing the lack of an eye. There is a mind. Just enjoying that, experiencing that blissful state of liberation. So eyes and water, that's just an analogy. Our mind is neither eyes nor water. So the analogy is limited in what it can actually express. But the way it's described, at least in this tradition, in other traditions they do talk about the mind discontinuing. Cut. End of story. There is that emphasis, there is that explanation. But actually, like the, the Dalai Lama, for instance, he talks about this. Like they say, even in the Buddha, in the case of the Buddha, it's like that. In some traditions, there, it is explained that even the Buddha's mind, after the Buddha died, he went out of existence. And what His Holiness usually says is like, what? For three countless eons, you work to become a Buddha, and then you have 84 years, not even that, 84 minus 36, because the Buddha only became enlightened at the age of 36. So you work so hard, to teach for 50 years and you go out of existence? Was it worth it? Right? I don't know. This is a different kind of explanation. And the Buddha himself taught it. Why did he teach it? Because it was beneficial for some people. Because if you have very strong attachment to the self, if you are taught that, well, the self goes out of existence, that may be beneficial in that moment. But, as I said before, well, I haven't mentioned it actually, with regard to the teachings of the Buddha, the Buddha taught many different things according to what people needed. Sometimes he taught there was a self, sometimes he taught there was not. So which one to take on? Which one do you need to take literally and which one not? This is where reasoning comes in. So the Buddha taught so many different four philosophical schools and so many details. So here you need to apply logic. What makes sense and what does not make sense? That your mind does not continue? How can it not continue? The mind is clear in knowing. That clear in knowing nature of the mind disappears once you remove craving and self-grasping. It doesn't make sense. Then the self, if the mind continu discontinues after you become an arhat, that means the afflictions are in the nature of your mind. Because once they're gone, your mind cannot continue. 
right? That's the logic of that. If the mind cannot continue unless there are afflictions, then your mind cannot be separated from those afflictions. Not, not exactly, because like, like the body, when we are dying, mm -hmm. the atoms do, do, does not disappear, but they are completely... But that's what I'm saying. Atoms can dissipate. Your mind doesn't fall off into different pieces. That's different. If your mind were made of atoms, atoms are just building blocks that assemble together and form something. Our mind is not made of little pieces that come together to form an awareness and then when the craving is gone it splits off that would be mean it's physical it's not physical it's a continuum of awareness one moment giving rise to next giving rise to the next giving rise to the next so even when you're in our heart that basic awareness continues but now without the extras without the extra misperception but it's still not an enlightened mind because you still have, you have the imprints left. The imprints are still there. The imprints of the misperception and there's still work to be done. And once you're done enjoying this blissful state, then you'll enter the Buddhas. It said that they inspire you, they communicate with you and basically let you know there's more work to be done. However, they communicate that with you through mind-to-mind -mind communication, I guess. But you see, why in this tradition it is not encouraged to become an arhat first, to, to go to, to, to follow the Theravada tradition and only then become a Buddha. It's not emphasized. Why? Because it takes longer. Because if you initially, all you want to do is just become liberated. If that's your wish. That's what you're going to do. You're going to work only towards becoming liberated. And once you're liberated, you just enjoy that for a while. Because that's what you aim for in the first place. So there's nothing that motivates you to go on. You just enjoy that liberated state. And in the meantime, you, you, you're not interested in continuing to practice because you've reached your goal. That's what you set out to do. It's a little bit like, I give the example, and it's not a good example, so don't take it literally, but if you want to go from... Dharamsala to Bombay, you have to travel through Delhi. That's traditionally the road. I don't know whether now they have new ways, but when you took a train from Dharamsala to Bombay, you would always have to go to Delhi first and then continue to Bombay. Okay. Now, that being the case, well, Dharamsala doesn't have a train station, but nearby there's a place called Patangot, so you take the train from there, <laughs> go to Delhi. Well, if you live there, you know what I'm talking about. Here I have to explain it, but I can't think of an example. In, 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 well, maybe if you want to go to the north, you have to go through <laughs> Jerusalem or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> Whatever. So, anyway, this is similar to liberation, Buddhahood. Bombay is Buddhahood. I know, it doesn't work. <laughs> Delhi is liberation. <laughs> Patangot, which is like the place you get on the trains, like being ordinary. All right. Now, in order to become a Buddha, you always have to be liberated first. But if your goal was to go to Bombay, yeah, you go through Delhi, but you don't stop there for a long time because you're not done yet. Right? You get a ticket all the way to Bombay, you only have a short stop over and, and continue on. While if you wanted to go to Delhi, that was your main goal. You're going to get off the train first and spend some time in Delhi before you're ready to move on. Because that was the, the initial motivation. <coughs> and such is the power of the mind. I mean, you can set out, I'm going to wake up at 4 in the morning, and you do. It's the power of the mind. You do wake up in the morning if you just set your mind in that way. So likewise, if you're determined to become liberated, if that's what you want to do, you're not going to move on to enlightenment right, right away. Because... You want to be liberated and you can enjoy that state for a while. But then people are suffering. We can do so much more with this incredible mind, but we're ignoring others in that moment. So it's better to aim for enlightenment right away because then we do become liberated in the meantime. You can't help it. It's part of the process. But in the back of your mind, I need to benefit these people. I need to help all these living beings. So many living beings are suffering. And of course you can't liberate all sentient beings. Of course you can't. You, you generate that wish, which is not a wrong consciousness, because you do it intentionally, intentionally. But you can liberate some that other Buddhas cannot liberate. 
Okay, this is a question that often arises. Like people say, well, there are lots of Buddhas around. Why should I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings? If I become liberated, that's enough. All the other Buddhas can do it, <laughs> right? They're enough. Everyone else can. I'll be liberated, and that's fine. But that actually doesn't make sense because a Buddha can only directly benefit the people that have a karmic connection with that person. We have a connection with certain people, and we have no connection with other people, with other living beings. And so, what the Lamas do, like the Dalai Lama is a good example, he tries to connect with as many people as possible. Not to become famous and have lots of Facebook friends. He doesn't have Facebook. Well, there's someone who has a Facebook page on him, but I don't think he's busy with that. So, <laughs> it's not about just, well, my motivation would be like people like me, blah, blah, and I feel good about myself. No. His motivation is... The more, connect, the more karmic connection he has with people, the more he's able to benefit these people. But if there's no karmic connection from the side of the, 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 the living beings, you can't really benefit them. So that's why becoming a Buddha makes so much sense, because throughout our different lives, we have different connection with people, and we can, we can benefit certain people that maybe another Buddha cannot. Right? So that's why, although we will never be able to benefit all sentient beings, that is our intention. And then the people we make connection with now, because of this common kind of connection we have, therefore, in the end, we can help them. And so it's so important if we can just take <coughs> one person out of their suffering. It's absolutely worthwhile. One person. But even if we become liberated, we cannot be fully effective to liberate others, to help others. First you. And then Shoshka. Yeah. It's not really a question. I want to share with you certain thoughts I'd like to hear what you say. Mm -hmm. We started with the Four Noble Truths, which speaks about suffering. Yes. It does not speak about happiness. Okay. It speaks about suffering. Okay. How to stop suffering. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it so clear that stop suffering is happiness? Is it so... Number two, we started with stop suffering. Mm -hmm. Suffering, I think each one of us knows what is it. Mm -hmm. Happiness, I don't know if we know. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, there are many hundred thousand of definition and attitude and what is suffering, blah, 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 blah. So I don't know what does it mean. Mm -hmm. How come from stop suffering, we reach to the point of getting enlightenment and Buddhahood and this and saving all world? Just a minute, I'm in my suffering. <laughs> what, 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 what? I don't, uh, in, in English there's a map road. What, what, what is the map road here? Where are we going from where to where? We are in the, in the process of stop suffering. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, this is the big, the biggest wisdom mm -hmm. of the Buddha, the mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. person or human being that mm -hmm. stated the state of what, what is the situation. The reading of the map is. I, I don't know. Because I, I heard you mentioning, I think, 15 minutes ago, the word happiness. And I said, What is she talking about? What's happiness? How happiness come to Buddhism? I don't remember. I didn't read Buddha. Mm -hmm. But Four Noble Two doesn't speak of happiness. What is happiness according to Buddhism? Does Buddhism also has his own happiness to preach to? So I'm not asking you, I'm just, you know, you, I, mm -hmm. I have many questions, doubts, I don't know what to mm -hmm. All right, when I talked about Buddhahood, this is far ahead. This is far ahead, but Buddhism, especially this tradition, that is the main goal, to become a Buddha. I'm not saying that it's your main goal, I'm not saying that it's everyone's main goal, but I think it's important to just know that that is the goal. Whether you aim for it or not, it doesn't matter. That's up to you. But it's possible. So this road is there as, as a possibility. But like I said, you don't need to choose that. You can just start off, and we start off with that. We start with the Four Noble Truth. Now I would disagree that happiness is not mentioned. Why? Because we believe, 
Well, why is, why is suffering mentioned more? I would agree with that. There's more of an emphasis on suffering than there is an emphasis on happiness. Why? Because we mistake certain states of suffering as being actual happiness. We are basically satisfied with too little. We aim, we aim, for, we want to be happy. All of us want to be happy. We all agree on that. That's why we're interested in Buddhism to remove that which is in the way to being happy, which is suffering. Okay. Now, what is exactly that happiness? I don't know. What is exactly the color blue? I mean, to exactly say this is blue and this is not, very difficult to define. But I know what I want. I want a certain state of contentment, being, ha being calm, and satisfied. That's, I guess, we would define as happiness. It's difficult to define it, but I know that's what I'm aiming for. Whatever I do, it's not like, oh, this will lead to torture, I'll do this. That's not what I'm, I want, I, I, there's always the promise of happiness behind it, okay? And that's why we act. So we can all agree we want to be happy. But we're looking for happiness in situations that are actually not happiness. From a Buddhist point of view, we're looking still for a type of suffering. This is why we, we mention suffering. It's still a form of suffering. And therefore we cannot experience real happiness because we're always aiming for more suffering or just a, a different form a different form of suffering which we usually mistakenly perceive as happiness. Now, let me give you an example that one of my teachers once gave. I've given that example before, but I, maybe you may, you may not have been there. Um, actually, from a Buddhist point of view, all our experiences right now are suffering, are in the nature of suffering. They're actual sufferings, a type of suffering. But we perceive as, as them as happiness because let's take the example of temperature. Okay, now please... Don't go into the relativity of temperature here. I mean, don't, don't take it too literally. But let's take enlightenment is 25 degrees. Liberation, the sense of happiness, the sense of satisfaction, this deep sense of well-being and contentment can be said equal to 25 degrees. If you, can, if you can take that as an example. Right now, what we call suffering is minus 10 degrees. Okay, minus 10 degrees. Zero degrees is like neither suffering nor happiness. And then 10 degrees plus, so from one to 10, that's what we call happiness. Is that actual happiness? No, in comparison to what is possible, 25 degrees, it's suffering. But because we don't know anything better, when we go from minus 10 to zero and to plus 10, we go, oh, that's happiness. That's happiness. Because in relation to something worse, that's what we call happiness. The absence of minus 10 degree, of minus, I don't know, all the way to minus one, I don't know, whatever, it's just an example, right? So don't take it too literally. But to, so the warmer it gets, the more, but the problem is also, Within this temperature, we can never hold on to plus 10, right? We cannot hold on to it. So our problem is not only is plus 10 not actually the 25 that are possible, but also when we reach those plus 10, inevitably we lose that again. We cannot hold on to this. Actually be okay. We could always experience the same kind of happiness, what we talk as or of ordinary happiness, if we could at least hold on to it. You know, the first, the, the, the 10 degrees would be if you're really, really hungry, and the first spoon of hummus. <laughs> oh, 10 degrees. Blissful. But then, the second spoon, it's only 9 degrees. Right? It will not get greater. In fact, it will only go down. There's no way. Because, of course, that's just in the nature of our mind. So we cannot hold on to it. If we could have those... This first spoon of hummus kind of blissful happiness all the time, I think I would settle for that. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of would settle for it. But that's the problem, we can't. That's the problem, we can't hold on to it. There's a moment of bliss and then it goes, inevitably. So we're always caught, we're caught in this 
the situation of the 10 degrees cannot hold them. 